to the Doctor Who Marathon. I'm your host, Kidam, and today we're going to be talking about the Sarah Jane Adventure episode, The Eternity Trap, written by Phil Ford and directed by Alice Troughton. This is a story I don't hear a lot of people talk about. Um, when people talk about like their favourite episodes, it's never mentioned, not even like in the worst episodes. Uh, it seems to be um, overshadowed. Maybe because the previous episode, The Wedding of Sarah Jane, was the one that, uh, that reintroduced the Tenth Doctor into the Sarah Jane Adventures uh, series and also had his last filmed performance as the Doctor within his tenure. So I can understand that. And uh, if you are not a fan of this story or maybe you feel like it belongs in that um, in that it's okay line of episodes. That's completely fair. However, I really, really enjoyed it. This is a typical haunted house story where a bunch of characters um, they go into a haunted house, um, experiencing the paranormal uh, with ghosts and and entities whilst at the same time obviously being it in a Doctor Who franchise being explained as some sort of of alien or extraterrestrial uh, intervention. So in that sense I can understand that it's not particularly uh, original. It's a kind of story which you've seen a lot in Doctor Who. However, if you've been watching my videos for a while, you might know that I am an absolute sucker for these kind of stories. With episodes such as Ghostlight um, being some of my favourite episodes of the, of the series. As well as uh, Eye of the Gorgon uh, being an episode I really enjoyed from series one of the Sarah Jane Adventures. And episodes like um, Something in the Rain... Um, be one of my favourite episodes in Torchwood. I just love it when sci-fi and spookiness um, interacts with one another and have this kind of atmosphere about it whilst our characters are solely uh, uh, their, their ideas of what science is is kind of pushed to the limits and usually uh, it's either explained as a as a as something reasonable in the terms of Doctor Who universe, that being um, uh, aliens and stuff like that, um, or some of the best ones in my opinion, leave it up in the air as to what they actually have in store. Um, and some episodes like Ghostlight make it so unneedlessly <laughs> complicated that your brain is still working out um, what the hell you witnessed like 13 years after it aired. So yeah, um, does this story hand a, hand a candle to Ghostlight? Of course not! Ghostlight is one of my favourite stories. I'm not gonna... that's not a fair comparison. But in terms of its own story, its own little adventure, um, I do really uh, enjoy this, uh, with some of it being some of the most standout moments in the Sarah Jane Adventures. But before we get into that, um, this is the only Sarah Jane Adventure episode where we don't actually see Bannerman's Road. Um, it never appears on screen. Uh, the entire episode takes place in this um, sort of castle. It's Ashen Hill Manor, which I don't actually know it's a real place. I did try to look up um, location uh, for the episode, and all it can give me is that it was filmed in the same place as, um, as Forest of the Dead, which doesn't help at all because Forest of the Dead was actually shot in a few different locations. So... I don't actually know where where this episode was filmed. However, there is a shot which is from later on uh, in the Stephen Moffat area, which um, is like this garden with a 
with uh, something in uh, with this like fountain in the middle, and that is actually being used on several occasions in the Stephen Moffat era, mainly as uh, the place where Missy takes her um, her spirits, uh, the, all the dead people, to this uh, to this location. So could that tie into that? Who knows? We'll get into more theories about this episode later because there is a massive fan theory about this episode and so basically what's happened also as well um tommy knight who plays luke uh, sarah jane's uh, son also doesn't make an appearance in this episode the reason given is that he wants to go home, stay home and study for school whilst clyde and ronnie um investigate it is kind of strange that Sarah Jane would take these two kids without Luke. Like, that doesn't seem... Like, could you imagine, like, going and investigating or doing something uh, with your f friend's mother? Do you see what I mean? That does kind of feel kind of strange to me. But, uh, obviously, uh, Clyde and Rani are the regulars of the show. And the reason uh, behind the scenes is that Tommy Knight was actually... Um, studying for his GCSEs because you know there's they're still kids and they're still in in school or at least um Tommy Knight um who played uh, Luke is still a kid I believe Andrew Mahindra and um oh it's on the tip of my tongue the kid that plays Clive um they were actually pretty older uh than Tommy Knight so they actually uh, got to appearance so that out of the way um let's get into the episode because we basically what happens is that uh, professor rivers who's appeared in a few episodes previously like episodes like um the lost boy and what else was she in i believe she was in was she in prison of the jadoon i can't remember but she's appeared um throughout Sarah Jane, she actually returned, she basically tells Sarah Jane that uh, she's investigated this haunted house and basically she turns to Sarah Jane for anything, not only a bit of publicity, but also get her help because she's helped her in the past. And it's also here that we get introduced to uh, Toby Silverman, this kind of eccentric um, scientist-like character who does his best to experience um, the paranormal. Now, the fact that they, we have a, such a small crew with uh, two new characters where uh, we're exploring this house and trying to find out if it's aliens or supernatural with the, the two guest characters being the ones that believe in the, the supernatural reminds me a lot of the 11th Doctor story, Hyde. It, yeah, it's exactly the same premise, isn't it? Um, now, Toby Silverman is played by none other than Adam Gillian, who at the time was a massive name for playing a character in the hit, uh, I believe it's BBC programme, uh, Benadorm. Uh, and uh, his character, he, he plays the character exactly the same as he played in... Uh, in that role and I was kind of worried because I wasn't I'm not I do like the character that he plays in Benidorm but Benidorm doesn't really fit my humor and I can easily see this type of character being a drag on the episode but Adam Gillian really knows how to have this really eccentric quirky character who's very timid he's very um soft in certain regards um and reason really it in a way where you he becomes really believable in this role and he becomes like the one of the main regulars as professor river is quickly ca captured in the first episode and is basically stuck as a sort of ghost-like entity so really the majority of the plot for part one uh, like most uh, most uh, haunted episodes has basically our characters 
experience as like ghosts aren't real and then all of these creepy and eerie stuff start happening and when it comes to stuff like this um what makes i believe a haunted house story why i love them so much why ghosts like why stories like this and i the gorgon and other episodes why i like them so much is that these simple stories that heavily rely on just strange things going on can really show off how great a director you have and when you have the director of midnight doing your episode you know you're in good hands alice troughton here this might be a sin to say because like i said she directed uh midnight but i personally believe this is her best work so far i'm not making this up there are some really awe-inspiring shots of eeriness there's a great moment where uh clive and rani they've gone into a uh, small little garden which is filmed in that uh, location i mentioned and there's this like a little like i don't know what the hell it is it's like this little hut house thing and there's this like little tiny room and they go inside and then they can hear water falling uh with the fountain just suddenly like turning on they walk out to investigate and only finding like footprints wet footprints leading back to the the hut that they were in and that slow pan from rani and clive's um looking at the footprints leading back into the house where they uh, into the building they just were it's so mm, gorgeous there's a lot of great dark shots there's a lot of great dark angles and there's some really just in terms of horror really awe inspiring another great shot of mine one of my favorite moments um in terms of its atmosphere there's a scene in which basically uh, Professor Rivers has gone missing and she keeps appearing as sometimes as this ghost-like entity and sometimes like her voice appears on the on the radio. For example, uh, just after she gets captured, they hear uh, she gets they contact her on the radio and she's calling out and uh, Toby is just like, oh, you had us worried there for a moment. Um, uh, where are you? Where we're in the nursery where you were. And then she's just calling out, it's like, where am I? Uh, how did I get here? Uh, can anybody help me? Help me. Um, and she just vanishes. But she keeps appearing in, like, audio and televisions and stuff. And Sarah Jane is just like, there's clearly some sort of reasonable explanation. Maybe it's some sort of to do with aliens. And then there's this record player that is stuck on a loop. Because if you, if you have a scratch, it can sometimes get stuck in, like, a in like a 10 second loop and you hear professor rivers voice and so what the camera does is it kind of like pans up to sarah jane elizabeth slater the acting all over the board in this episode we'll talk about two other guest stars later on but the acting in this story is probably some of the best acting in the sarah jane series so far it can it, I don't know why the story got such a great cast compared to regular Sarah Jane Adventure episodes. None of the supporting cast treat this episode as if they're in a T-Kid show. Um, I mean, Adam St. Gillian plays the, his character pretty silly and eccentric, but that's more the character and less with him. And he pl and there's a lot of moments where he where he's taken it seriously and... And you really feel for the character. But yeah, just acting overall is great. But anyway, back to this shot. What is, I love about this shot, it, uh, it pans up to Sarah Jane. And the camera is shot in the way where usually you have like Sarah Jane and then you just have like an empty space in the background. Um, that was great about like horror is that you can play with people's expectations and... Really, the rule book of how to make sh like a great shot and stuff does kind of go out of the window when you're doing a eerie atmosphere like this because you want to play with people's expectations. You want to imply stuff with the camera 
rather than actually state it and you can have so much fun with that creativity and Alice Troutman really does because this empty space whilst you're here in Professor Rivers basically shows us the absence of Professor Rivers. It's almost as if she is there on the screen but is invisible. Yeah, it's, it's, and then the camera actually then goes back so that Sarah Jane is normally, uh, is normal again, central in the image. And the camera kind of pans out, kind of giving this loneliness to Sarah Jane as if, um, as if, you know, she was with someone, some, there was someone there, but now she's alone again. That is awe-inspiring. When I saw that shot, this was the, the, the first time I watched this was for this, to do this for this marathon. That, that, that caught, my mouth was jaw open when I saw that. That was just inspiring directed. It's stuff like this that makes me such appreciative of the camera work of the directors and the cameramen and camera women. It's just, it just looks so good. That's all I can really say about it. That's what makes these kind of stories so good. It's that you can play with the camera angles and play with these uh, imagery. But what is the, what are they um, examining? What's the investigation all about? Well, it seems that many years ago, it's actually the, the prologue to the, the story. In 1665, there was um, Lord uh, Marchwood played by uh, Callum Blue, who, I just want to say it, what a performance! I don't know if he's like some sort of like Shakespearean acting. This is the only thing I've seen him in, although I have heard he's uh, good as Zod in the um, DC TV series Smallville. But, let's, um, let's get off topic here. But here, like... Does, like he's really like giving it his all despite him being a guest star in a kids program because let's, let's don't forget Sarah Jane is a kids program especially designed for kids he plays it with such sincerity when he says that his kids have gone missing and that that he's torn by it you can see it in his face that it is tearing him apart but uh, many years ago, back in uh, 1665, he hired a, a man named Darkerin um, as an alchemist. Alchemists, for those of you who don't know, are kind of like magicians years ago that believe that were led to believe that they could turn anything into gold. And whoever um, the alchemist worked for would like become rich and famous and blah, blah. But Darkerin never was able to create gold. And he seemed to be taking uh, children and uh, taking people uh, throughout history, um, Marchwood came in to investigate and something happens. And now, uh, for, since then, all through time, uh, you have people go into the house to investigate these uh, appearances of apparent ghosts of Lord Mirkwood and his children, with stories stating that He's still there, haunting the building, uh, trying to find his children uh, from the from darkening, and and whilst that happens, there's a lot of people that actually go missing. With the main investigation being that the entire family that lived, the last family that lived in Ashton Hill Manor, all disappeared with the house locked from the inside which puts the 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 the, the creepiness right at the, the front of the of the story and the story does play around with the idea of beliefs with Sarah Jane right off the bat not believing about a um, about ghosts and even Professor Rivers but she is open-minded and she actually is like right I don't believe in ghosts either however this is a great chance, a great opportunity to prove the facts, to see if there is a, if there is facts for one way or the other. And so that's what basically uh, brought him here. Whereas Clive, um, he is 
very confident in himself. You know, it's it's Clive, how quirky character Clive. But he uh, seems to be a bit of a chicken, as despite him uh, stating he's not, there are many hints throughout the story in which he is pretty terrified. And him and Rani become really close in this story. There's a lot of scenes in which they're scared and they're kind of like hugging each other and they're giggling to each other with um, these little small remarks. It feels like they're a couple in this story. Or if they're not, like this is the start of a relationship. I honestly don't know if that will play into later episodes. Like, I've only seen a handful of Sarah Jane adventures prior to all this. And in terms of the ones that I've seen post this episode, I've only seen... I've only watched one episode um, that actually takes place after this adventure. So, I'm not sure if they do become a couple. I've heard that there are hints um, throughout the stories, like in Mad Woman in the Attic, um, with Rani's children being... Uh, a mixed colour of her skin and Kai's skin so maybe there is a maybe there are a couple and this is where that kind of blossoms out but that's what I, that's the idea that I was getting throughout this this uh, story and especially how they both uh, make jokes about Ghostbusters as if they're both huge Ghostbusters fans that I mean that is romance right there come on people <laughs> um, and there are some really great little beats in here there's um, there's this creature we never get to see properly and in fact I don't think we ever really get an idea of what the hell it is like it's never really explained is it working for Darkin is it just a creature that lives within this um, astral projection form all we see of it in the dark are two red eyes that follow um, our characters around. I really wish that we did see it kind of kill someone, just to, you know, establish a threat there. But just the imagery of, like, we don't actually see it, it's just two eyes. It's a, it's a very simple, very cheap, but a very simple uh, mechanism to show a potential threat right there. And our characters take it absurdly seriously um, and both times they get saved by Lord Merchwood um, who appears as a sort of not as a ghost but he kind of like appears and disappears um, and he's still seemingly the same age that he when he was captured in 1665 and he basically explains that Darkening has taken his children and he's been taking people and he's been looking for his children for 300 years with Sarah Jane and Clive actually seeing the children at the house um, uh, before. And when he hears that someone has actually seen his children, that he is in the same building, he does kind of like break down. And this is what I mean. Um, Callum Blue's performance is just strikingly great in this episode. So let's talk about um, Dark Den because he is this very mysterious character. He starts out as the, what we learn as a alchemist, which quickly gets revealed to be like you know he was an he's actually a alien that was developing this technology back then, and um, he didn't fix it in time, uh, which is supposedly a teleporting system which will transport him to another world back to his home planet, and that he will. Um, he planned to do this but it was faulty and that the technology at the time wasn't so great and so all it really did was stuck people in another dimension um, between this world and another dimension and that's why we get all of these strange aliens occurrences I did kind of wish that we didn't get an explanation as to all of it they should have just kept it like a nice mystery, um, like Ghost Light. Um, not to say that this story is bad by any chance, because there is this great mystery. Um, we learn that like Darkening is doing all this, but we don't really understand why he does this. 
And that is where the mystery of this episode comes from. It's from the... Um, from just who Darkinen is. We know he's an alien, but we never get a identification of his species. We learn that he's creating a, a dimensional... Um, a dimension to get him back to his home world um, but we never learn where his home world is even if it's another galaxy or another dimension which is kind of hinted as um, everything that's been revolved in the episode is um, uh, multi-dimensional but also as well when all of this ghost and strange stuff happens he has no interest in going back he just seems interested in capturing souls keeping them there in this purgatory and it kind of just amuses him and he seems just to be this really antagonistic character now he is played by the fantastic donald sumter uh, sumter and he is a fantastic actor who's been in doctor who before he was in the wheels in space and I believe he was in the Sea Devils. I can't remember who he played in the Sea Devils. But I'm pretty sure he was in the Sea Devils. And he's also um, known for like other roles. Which, funny enough, I can't name at the moment. Um, but he really gives his character a gravity. Um, a Vanessa. Um, so he does sometimes give this character silly inflictions. Like... Um, like, let's, for example, if he says, like, you will die, he goes, you will die um, sometimes. But um, with the exception of a few beats, the, the strange eeriness of his voice really fits. And, and he's just a great presence. And as I stated with all the other cast, they really took this episode to the another level. But Darkening, there's a fan theory about Darkening, which we were going to get into. And that theory is that he is a Time Lord. His technology is very similar to Time Lord technology, as Sarah Jane once explained uh, when they find his technology, that she used to travel in something very similar to the technology that he was using, implying the TARDIS. Um, at one point, Clive compares him to the Doctor, the aliens that look like us. Um, Darkening wears a clo um, clothes uh, very similar to the Valyard, with even with the, the the strange hat. Though I will state that that is a usual uh, attire for those days, especially for people who identify as like magicians or alchemists. Um, but yeah, there's a, a, and there's also the fact that you know he is he is this a strange entity, and maybe the reason he didn't want to get back home is because the, at the moment there was no home, that there was uh, nothing to return to. The time war basically stopped him from going home, and he's happy just staying here. He's also um, obsessed with staying alive. He um, he worked out a way that every soul he captures keeps him alive, keeps him basically an immortal. And that does kind of feel like the Valyard again, with when a Time Lord is on their final regeneration. Usually what happens is that they basically become mad to keep their their status alive with characters like Barusa, for example. And Great fan theory. I wasn't too keen on it um, prior. However, in the twelfth Doctor story, which you know that I know we're talking about way later on in the canon, but hear me out. Rassilon appears in the twelfth Doctor story, Hell Bent. Rassilon in that story is played by Donald Sumpler. The same guy that plays Darkening, a Time Lord. In that story, the Twelfth Doctor banished Rassilon off Gallifrey. What if it's Rassilon who has come to Earth and taken people in to punish the Doctor? And especially when it's revolving around his one of his friends, Sarah Jane. What if 
This is actually Rassilon interfering with the life of Earth to basically get revenge on the Doctor because it's his favourite uh, planet, Earth. Hmm. If I did generally believe that, I would have watched this story after Hellbent. I'm not, so you can kind of see that. It's, 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 it's a nice idea. I really do like it. But um, I personally feel like the character is played in such a different way that, that I do think it's still possible. If somebody wants to think about that, they could. But I feel like the, sto the characters are clearly supposed to be uh, different in in that sense. So that is some really cool stuff. And there's a lot of great eerie and, um, and magnificent um, performances from Donald Sumter. Um, and the episode ends with them tricking um, Darkening into this uh, technology which allows this magnetic electrical pulse to basically imprison him and separate him from his energy source and killing him, freeing all of the souls that were um, trapped within this uh, dimensions between dimensions where Sarah Jane turns off the machine and everybody who was previously completely absorbed by the machine is um, seemingly is killed with uh, Professor Rivers, who was only partly absorbed because she was only recently taken, get, comes back into normal reality and seemingly has either no memory or very little of it because when she revives back, she's kind of less like, oh, uh, Toby, you idiot, you... Um, you messed up all the equipment and now we have no evidence of what we just saw. So I don't know if it's implied that she forgot her experiences in the dimensions between dimensions, but um, it, that could be a possibility. Uh, with the Sarah Jane Adventures crew ending on a happy note with, um, uh, with Sarah Jane looking through a window and seeing Merchwood uh, reunited with his kids. And it gives, it gives a nice little sweet ending to this adventure. Also, before I end the video, there is another fan theory in this episode because um, Toby Silverman basically explains at one point in the episode why he believes in ghosts and why he uh, is at least fascinated with the supernatural. And he explains that when he was a kid, he saw an entity without a face, with many people suggesting... This could be the trickster. I don't know what the trickster would need of Toby Silverman, and if so, how he'd affected uh, the timelines to cause chaos. Surely, if he altered him, he would have used him to get to Sarah Jane. However, nothing like that ever happened, so I'm not too sure. But that, that comment about him seeing a creature with... Um, no face it's kind of just brought up and it's just never mentioned again um it's like it's not part of the plot it's just like a little like plot thread hanging in the air and i love stuff like that where it's just like we don't get answers did he see a ghost when he was a kid or whether uh or that was an alien or whether it was just his overworked imagination who's to say but I love, I love that it's in the air and people can theorise about it. So that is The Eternity Trap. A really enjoyable episode. I really had a lot of fun with this. And I feel like it is overshadowed. Sure, if you are somebody who isn't so interested in haunted house stories or do find them kind of repetitive, you might be disappointed here. It doesn't do anything groundbreaking, doesn't do anything really new with the format in terms of plot. In terms of plot, it basically goes where you would expect it to go. It was aliens uh, the, it caused by an alien. People uh, caused, caught in it. Uh, the ghosts are actually people trapped uh, between the dimensions. Um, and it, in that case, it's a very uh, cliched story. It is a very, very cliched story. And Phil Ford 
is right in here um, is pretty okay in terms of plot structure. However, the director, Alice Troughton's directing, uh, Phil Ford's script in terms of what the character's actually saying, and most importantly in this story, the acting throughout the board is just amazing. And you can see that a lot of effort and a lot of love and care and appreciation for horror was put in into this episode for a kids program and i can honestly just really appreciate that and that makes this story actually one of my favorite sarah jane adventures episodes we've talked so far i know we say that a lot but i generally mean it here this is easily an episode which i can easily see myself re-watching time and time again maybe in october time that would be this would be a great episode to watch in october so anyway that is the eternity trap so join me next time where k9 and his handful of friends start getting chased around by a mysterious foe so join me next time for the bounty hunter and i'll see you next time on the doctor who marathon Ta -da. <laughs>